So I'm going to talk today a little bit about me because, you know, that's always fun to talk about yourself, right? And I'm sure you want to know all about my background, all that kind of stuff. And I want to talk about what is fashion law and where is it today and how we got to where we are today. And then I want to talk about where we're going to go in the future because I think that's how and how you can get involved in the future. If you're interested in fashion and you're here in law school and you want to think, wow, there's this great field, how do I combine the two? What path should I take and how will I get there? And it's interesting to be able to talk to you guys today from both the practicing lawyer side, the fashion industry side, and the academic side as well. So we're going to talk about that. All right. So as Amanda said, my name is Stacy. I am from a long line of apparel manufacturers in my family. My mom was in the industry. My grandfather was in the industry. My great-grandfather was in the industry. My mom had clothing stores and um, was a manufacturer. My grandfather was a textile salesperson, and my grandfather owned textile mills in South Carolina. So when I was little, my mom got divorced when I was very young, and so when I was little, she would take me to work with her all the time. I was five years old, I learned to sew on the very big industrial sewing machines. I was a little bit older, I learned to attend, I packed my first box, and at 12 I was writing purchase orders at trade shows, and I teased my mother now looking back, and there's no such thing as child labor when it comes to your own children, right? So <laughs> she didn't violate any laws, and there I am sewing little things on the machine. Like, can you imagine, right? Like, there's this little, and I was tiny. I didn't hit five foot till I was 16 years old, so I was all like this little on the big machines, and they propped me up on pillows, it was very funny. So I would tell you my mom that whatever size I was, that's what she did. So when I was a kid, she made kids' clothes. When I got a little bit older, she had preteen, and we sold clothes from people in their 11-year-olds all the way through their mom. So we would got, I got hands-on experience in retail and actually working with customers and selling clothes to customers. And my dad, she got remarried. She likes to be married, but she can't seem to stay married. So if I give them it out with like my dad and my stepdad, they're all like, we have this crazy blended family. So... That might be oversharing, but you know, there's not that many of us. We could have like a conversation and it'll be okay. So I was in retail and then I went to college and I always wanted to be a lawyer. Like always, always, always. And it didn't really seem to be in the cards for me because, you know, I was raised and my nice Jewish daughter, my mom would take me, I need your help, I need your help. I'm like, Mom, you know, like you're, that's the way we kind of talked. I need your help. And she's like, come work for me. I want to, you know, I want to go to the mall. I want to go take the tea to Boston. I want to go do all these things. And she's like, you got to help me. I'm like, fine. She's like, I'll give you some clothes. I'm like, okay. You know, so she always knew how to kind of get me to do the right thing. And at dinner, we would talk about the issue she faced at work. And my dad, now my, it's actually my stepdad, she got married at the time. And he was the EVP for human relations and hiring at Stop and Shop, which is a big supermarket chain. I don't know, do you guys have it down here? Okay, sorry, because they started to call it the East Coast in the quarter. So we would talk about, like, the unions and welfare issue, health and welfare benefits, not welfare like the welfare system, but health and welfare benefits and employment laws and all this stuff. So I was very lucky to be raised in a household where business was discussed and these topics were discussed and, oh, I have to fire this sales rep or this style didn't sell or what do we do about this? And then I traveled with her, my mom, all over the country and we went down to Orlando right in the beginning, whether you think this is good or not, of the neon trend came out. So <laughs> we were down there when um, when bomb equipment started, like those kind of clothing lines came out and it was just really fun and you got to see the industry and I learned the industry from an insider's perspective. So I knew what it took to make clothes and I knew what it took to sell clothes. So then I went to school. I wanted to go to school in Stanford, and my mom wouldn't let me. She's, my rule was Mississippi or East. She's like, you're going to move to California. She knew I loved California. We were out there like three times a year with the palm trees, buying for her store, you know. And this is then moved a little bit forward. So like when Polo Beverly Hills was really popular, so we were there buying all those clothes for her store all the time. So we moved. I wanted to go to school out there, and I, she wouldn't let me. And I'm like, I hate the cold weather. Like, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Like, I, my hair used to freeze on the way to school. It used to drive me crazy, and I was a cheerleader, so I had, like, a backpack, and I had my school books, and you had your duck boots on. I'm like, there's no way I want this for the rest of my life. Like, it's just not going to work for me at all. So I ended up at Emory because it's as far away as I could get from New England, and I'm like, I didn't want the brick ivy buildings. I, like, I had enough of that. We can't tell them a little bit unconventional. <laughs> so I kind of had to do my own thing. 
And I went down to Emory, and I was there, and then my sophomore year, she calls me up. It's still all about my mother, right? You can tell that I have some, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so she calls me up, she's like, Stacy, sit down, I have to talk to you. I said, okay. She's like, I'm getting divorced, I'm selling my store, and I'm moving to California. Do you want to come? I'm like, Mom, are you kidding me? I'm like, I wanted to do this two years ago. I'm at Emory. I love it. I was in a sorority. I was on their cheerleading squad. They don't have football. They don't have basketball. But And it was a co-ed squad. And it was awesome because I was a competitive cheerleader. Now I have guys throwing me in the air. And I'm like, this is so much fun. And you think, I'm going to leave this and move to California because now you're getting divorced? I'm like, this is not OK. She's like, fine. So a few years later, I graduate. And this is, again, showing you my age. The Olympics were coming to Atlanta. And my whole plan was to take a few years off. I wanted to work as a law clerk or a paralegal or whatever the right words were. I called it a paralegal, but technically it wouldn't have been a paralegal, which I didn't know at the time. But I said, I want to work as a paralegal in a law firm, get a few years experience, and then take the LSATs and go to law school. Like probably, I don't know, many of you may have done something similar to that, or you may be going to stage two, but you know, not an uncommon path. So I graduated from, from, from college, and she calls me up. She's like, I'm starting a new company, and I need your help. You can imagine my response, right? I'm like, Mom, <laughs> you know I want to be a lawyer. Like, what am I going to do? She's like, I need your help. She's like, I'll tell you what. You can move to California. You can move, live with me while you find an apartment. And you can use my fax machine to look for a job. <laughs> <laughs> Again, showing you my age. That was a big deal back then, right? You remember the, like, the first fax machines? Nobody had them. It was with the paper that rolled, and it was like, and you ran out of toner in the middle of the fax, and you couldn't read your purchase orders. I mean, it, it was crazy. And I know maybe you guys might be too young, but you remember the fact that, I mean, oh, God. So I'm like, oh, okay. And, you know, I always wanted to move to California anyway, so it wasn't really that hard of a sell. But you know, the fax machine got me to California. So people ask, why I'm in California, the weather and the fax machines. All right, so I moved to California and I'm working with her and she had a Missy Garment Dye Knit Company. And for those of you who don't know, Missy is the old way of saying contemporary. It's there's so there's different sizes. You have your junior sizes, which is like a one, three, five, seven. Missy is your two, four, six, eight, ten sizes. And people don't like the word Missy, so now we call it contemporary. <laughs> but it's really addressed to a sizing system. And as women, sorry, you guys have it so much easier too. But that's a different story. But women, as we grow and develop, they have the juniors, which is like more of a, you know, girls have not developed yet. And Missy is like, oh, we have curves down. So that's the difference in the junior and Missy. So we made Missy Garment Dye Knits. And we, her business, she was in business for about a month. I joined her in January. Three weeks later, we get a huge full store buyout order from the Limited. And in, this is in 95. And in the, then the Limited was so much bigger than it is today. So the Limited owned Victoria's Secret, it owned Express, it owned all of their online versions, which were just starting to come online. So we got this huge order, and we're this itty bitty company, and we're like, what do we do? You know, so we turned down the order, we couldn't take it, but the goods were so popular that the company just was up and running from there. And then here I am, it was her and her partner, and her partner was like my aunt, she had moved from Boston too. I was in her wedding, I was a junior bridesmaid, it was very exciting. And we moved out here, and it was the two of them and me who were running this fashion company. And in, my, in our first year, we moved buildings three times. We were doing $5 million by the end of our first year. By the end of our second year, we were doing $15 million. And then I was like, this is awesome. People were like, so what did you do? I'm like, I ran production and then ran the company. And what that means, for those of you who are not in the fashion industry, and running production means you make sure that everything gets made on time, on price, on budget with the right hang tags hanging off of it and shipped to the right place and the right boxes with the right crap written on the side so the distro center won't bounce it back or worse, give you chargebacks, which are the death of like a thousand paper cuts to manufacturing companies. So it turned out then in the third year, her and her partner, and again, this woman was like my aunt, got into this huge fight, which tends to happen in the apparel business. Like you, you see serial entrepreneurs, everyone like starts a company, gets really successful, fights or sells it, and then you know they start all over again. So yes, it happened to my mom and her partner, and they were so pissed off at each other, they couldn't decide who was going to buy who out. So they ended up shutting down the company. To this day, just as a side note, they don't talk. And this is a woman who was like my aunt. It was a very influential person in my life, but they couldn't. They didn't talk. And at that point, I was three years out of college. 
and I could have gone back to law school, it kind of fit the plan, but I was making money, I had my own apartment, like I had my own car, all this really cool stuff, and I'm like, I'm not going to school now, and it turned out I was really good at helping, people would say, what's one thing, you know, they get those interview questions, what's those one thing, like what animal would you have to be an animal, or what's one thing your resume doesn't say about you that I need to know about you, and I would tell people that I'm a translator, and what does that mean in the apparel business? Well, you have these very creative people, and then you have the accountants. And neither of them understand each other. And I had this skill that I was able to help your fashion people and the creatives and your accountants communicate. And that's something now as a professor we work on a lot, you know, having your left brain and right brain and training both sides of that in my students. But at that time, it's a very rare thing. And you'll have a designer, and they'll come and I'm like, they're like, I want this button. I'm like, how much is the button? $10. Okay, how many do you need? Six. How much is the garment going to sell for? Wholesale. $10. Okay. Well, that's simple math, right? Six times 10 is 60. So your button cost is going to be more than your whole garment wholesale price. I'm like, you can't have those buttons. They're like, but I need these buttons. These are magnificent buttons. And it sounds like a kind of ridiculous conversation. Like if you're, you're in law school, you're going to be lawyers. But this kind of stuff, and you guys probably know what I'm talking about, this kind of stuff is very common in the apparel industry. And you have to balance the needs of the creatives versus the needs to make money. Because at the end of the day, while just kind of breaking even might be OK, we are working to make money. So I went from company to company to company, each one getting a little bit bigger. And I ended up at this $25 million company, and I was running that. And I looked around, and I'm like, well, I'm almost 30. I always wanted to be a lawyer. I don't want to be 70 and look back and say, should I have gone to law school and have regrets? And I was teaching at the time at FITM, which is the fashion industry of design and merchandising in Los Angeles. And I taught the business classes. So FITM is very, again, with this creative side versus this business side, they, were, they had like four business classes. I taught all of them. <laughs> and the students like hated them because they wanted to come in and draw pretty pictures or like sketch things or design stuff. And I actually made them write a business plan. They're like, what's this? And then we did a production plan. Like, they're like, what's this? And we did a cost sheet. They're like, I don't understand. I want my $10 buttons. You know, and even at the student stage, they really didn't get the way the business side of fashion and the creativity side of fashion work together. So I saw this need in the community. No one was really addressing where business and creativity met. And then I kind of have this weird thing. I don't know, maybe you guys might have it too. I like to read the fine print. So whenever we would get contracts or things from our contractors, I would flip them over and I'd read the fine print. I get very excited about these things. And I'm like, OK, so yes, it might be slightly OCD and dorky. But I was like, this is really cool. So how do I make this better? And you take that, given everything I learned growing up too, you see that fashion companies have this very steep learning curve. And people who have never launched a company or launched a brand before, so new neophytes in that area, if you could only teach them what they knew at that end of that journey in the beginning and they could start all over again, what would they do different? Because that first launch, that first year, sometimes 18 months, depending on your company, that's critical. And that time period will decide whether your company in general will make it or break it. And if you could know the right business things to do to incorporate with your creativity, the chances of success are exponentially higher. So I sat down with some people and I have a few mentors. There's a woman in, in Los Angeles. I call her the fairy godmother of fashion. She's like, see, that was cute when you were 30. Now that you're 40, we should just call it godmother of fashion. <laughs> and I'm like, Elsa, come on. I love the title. Like you wear your magic wand over everything and it just makes it work. And she's like, OK. And she tolerates me. But she was one of my early mentors. There's another gentleman in Los Angeles. And I said, she's like, she, Elsa said, go have breakfast with Bruce now. Deborah, you know Bruce Burton, do you by any chance? Bruce Burton? No. OK, you'll meet him in, in, at the, the anyways. Sorry. So go have breakfast with Bruce. Bruce is this guy. He looks like a WWD wrestler. He has like shaved head, handlebar mustache, came in cowboy boots, like the bolero with all the turquoise big rings. He is a lawyer in Hong Kong. He is a lawyer in Mexico. 
He is an accountant CPA in the United States, and he specializes in supply chain management. He also helped write NAFTA, which I think is really cool, and he was a fellow professor at FITM. So I take him out to, he says, let's meet for breakfast. We meet in Santa Monica at like 5.30 in the morning. I'm like, who meets at 5.30 in the morning? Are you kidding? And anyway, so he's like, he, okay. I told him what I wanted to do. So I think there's this need in the market where your, create, your creatives need to learn business and your lawyers don't understand the creative and there's this gap and we can really do some cool stuff to make the world a better place. And he's like, okay, here's what you need to do. I'm like, okay, I'm listening very attentively, right? You've had these breakfasts with these kind of scary people. And he hands me a pen. He's like, no, 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 write this down. Okay. So he hands me a pen. I flip over the placemat. And he's like, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And he's then so we drafted a plan together. I'm like, this makes sense to me because I'm a business person. So I roadmapped my next five years. He's like, if you want to go in-house into a fashion company, you need to go to law school. It needs to be a decent law school. You need to graduate in the top of your class because that will get you a job through OCI. So you go through OCI, you work as a summer associate, you get the job offer, God willing, you do a good job, and then you stay there, you know, five years is like the magic number that he's told me, and then you can go in-house because no one in-house can train you. They don't have those resources. They don't have the time. And I'm like, great. And I said, I want to focus on the fashion industry. I want to be a fashion lawyer. He's like, well, you know, there's no such thing as a fashion lawyer. But he's like, that kind of skill set really could be, is really needed by the fashion industry. So he's like, I think it's a great idea. But don't call yourself a fashion lawyer. I said, okay. <laughs> so off I went to law school. I followed the plan. I went to Loyola. I got the job at the OCI. I got a summer associate position. I got the offer. I went to law firm. And I was at Thielen, which, one is, which was one of the two very large California law firms that went out of business in 2008. So when I was 2006, I wrote a business plan, and I submitted it to the head litigation department head. And I said, you, they knew my background. They knew the story I just told you guys. And I said, I want to start a fashion law practice group. Here's the business plan. Here's my marketing plan. What do you think? I got very lucky because the head of my department, his name was Barry. He was from New York. And California people don't always get us New York people. Like, I was, so I was born in New York, and then we moved to Boston when I was three. So, you know, I grew up there, and then with the Atlanta, and then to LA. But I still consider myself a New Yorker. Court reporters still consider me a, report, a New Yorker. They're like, you talk way too fast. <laughs> They're like, slow down, we can't follow you. Like, okay. So he was like, no associate in the lifetime of, of his experience had ever submitted a business plan or a marketing plan. I was like, well, why not? We just don't do things that way here in law. And I was learning that law wasn't so different than the apparel industry because lawyers, kind of like doctors, you're either you're good, you're either like super smart, you can write this great brief, or you're like a manager and no one respects you because you don't have any business of your own, or you're a rainmaker. But to be able to do all of those different things, like you won't find that in one person. You know, I had a blog post on death of leadership up on my blog, and I offended some of my uh, <laughs> my partners at my law firm. But I think that in general, lawyers are horrible leaders. They don't have leadership skills. They didn't get an MBA. They haven't run companies, but I digress. So I submitted a business plan to him, and he's like, this looks great. And Thielen was having some issues at the time. Like, we were having partner defections. We were spiraling downward. So, you know, I always say luck is where opportunity and chance meet. And I, he took a chance on me. And I'm like, well, you know, we'll keep the lights on. Here's at least someone that's showing initiative or something like that. So I approved my budgets, and I thought just like any business, it would take two or three years to be able to develop my own business. And within three months, I was opening new matters. And then they, they send, at that firm, they would send new matter requests for conflicts purposes around the whole entire firm. So the whole firm of 650 people knew that I was doing this. And everyone would call me up. They're like, you're a, you're a fourth year. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I wrote a business plan. And they're like, what? And so it was really, <laughs> and they were all, it was just so shocking to so many of them that I had done this. And that I had the nerve to do something like that as an associate. And they actually approved a, a, a fashion law practice group. We launched, we held seminars, and then Thielen came crumbling down. And I was lucky enough to find Fox, which is where I am right now. It's a very entrepreneurial middle market firm. It's not an Amazon 100 firm, although we're getting there. But <laughs> to me, that was a hard thing too, because prestige mattered. 
but I was like, well, it's the right fit because apparel industry clients, which is my target market, they're not Fortune 100 companies. You know, they are they are family-owned businesses. They are run by serial entrepreneurs. They may eventually go public and sell their shares, but there's those are more the exception rather than the rule. So I wanted to be able to perform, to, for, to provide services to these companies that are in LA, and there's 10,000 apparel manufacturing companies in Los Angeles, and a lot of people don't know that. You know, most of the clothes, do you guys know what the average selling price of jeans are in America? Want to guess? No, less. Anyone, you guys? Average price, 1997 for denim in America, being sold right now. And I know that sounds crazy. I mean, Deborah, you came from true religion, so I know that probably sounds crazy to you. But, <laughs> which, I know, right? I got a pair from my four-year-old, and I'm like, woo, that didn't, certainly didn't cost 1997. Um, then I was lucky I had a second child, so we handed them down, and I think we actually got our cost per use down to where it was actually reasonable. But, so 1997 is your average cost of jeans. And where do those clothes come from? 90% of the apparel that you buy in all of the stores in the United States is designed in Los Angeles, if not made there. Manufacturing is coming back and it's starting to get bigger and bigger, but 90% of the apparel in the United States is designed in Los Angeles. And no one thinks of Los Angeles as a fashion capital. They all think, oh, it's New York. And I'm sorry, my, our New York friends who are here today. But it's not. Los Angeles surpassed New York in terms of dollars output and revenue produced from the clothing industry in 1998. And every year since then, we've produced more dollars than New York has. Apparel is a $350 billion industry. And most of those companies are located in Los Angeles. So of course the business plan worked. And if you have that right personality, you can go out there and you can target those customers and you can talk to them when you know where creativity and business meet. Because if you understand their business and you understand their supply chain and you understand their language, your odds of success with them are much higher than if you're just like, ooh, I like pretty things. I have a passion for fashion. I like Vogue. And I'm like, oh gosh, we're not going to get anywhere if that's the reason why you're becoming a fashion lawyer. When I first started, <laughs> as an aside, when I first started teaching at FITM, they make you teach introduction to manufacturing. And so I have, these are the 18, 19 year olds, they're freshmen in college, and they all come in there, and there's 18 of them, or 20 of them, and I ask them what they want it to be. Of the 20 students, 18 people said, I want to be a buyer. Okay. I said, well, what do you think a buyer does? They said, we get to go shopping. I'm like, fantastic, sounds like the perfect job, right? You go shopping with other people's money. And I'm like, oh no, I'm so sorry, but that's not what a buyer does. I'm like, are you good at math? They're like, no. I'm like, well, then you can't be a buyer, because if you can't, not good at math and you don't understand Excel or spreadsheets, buyers, all the, it's all about money, it's all about numbers, it's all about production flow and scheduling the right goods in the right store at the right time so the right person who walks in can buy it. And they're like, oh. And I'm like, what are you doing here? And we're at FITM. Like, why are you here? Who t didn't tell you that this is what a buyer does before you enroll in FITM, which is not an inexpensive school? I'm like, yeah. So problem, right? Creativity, business, laws, how do they work together? And so I set off to solve a problem. And I was very fortunate along the way that people believed in me and I was able to launch the Fashion Law Practice Group, both first at Thielen and then at Fox. They, they kind of saw it, they're like, they're okay. But like, they're like, we have a hospitality practice, we have a maritime practice, why not fashion law? I'm like, oh great, okay. So again, I had a non, I had a skeptical person, I submitted my business plan, I submitted my marketing plan, and he said yes. He said, fantastic. He's like, we're gonna give you a try six months, and if it works out, not my, he's like, you can stay. But in six months, if this whole fashion thing, if you prove to us that you're going to bring in these clients and do what you say, we'll put you on the website. We'll make you the chair of the practice group. We'll do all of these things. So I said, great. So in two months, he's like, Stacey, you're doing a great job. And we're going to give you your own practice group. And at the history of Fox, no associate had ever run a practice group. So we, went, we established a fashion law practice group. And now I have 17 members in my practice group across the firm. We have 19 offices, 600 lawyers at the moment. And we have lawyers doing all kinds of different, and I'm the chairperson, and we have lawyers doing all kinds of different stuff. So one of my pet peeves 
is when people say fashion law is just IP repackaged. And I know you guys are the intellectual property and technology journal, so I'm not, no offense to IP and I love it. Like I do a lot of IP work. So it is one of my favorite areas of the law. But fashion law is not that. It is an industry focused practice that brings in all of these different areas and disciplines, taking a business approach combined with the creativity and helping companies advise them what the law says. And you take the law and you apply it to their business. And I have lawyers in my group. There's one guy that specializes in retail leasing. There's another guy that specializes in fashion M&A. There's another person that specializes in inbound transactions from Europe. So he knows all the tax laws and codes and stuff. There's another person that specializes in franchise law. So if you can see fashion law is much, more, is much broader than just IP. And I, because I have an IP practice, and Susan, who runs the Fashion Law Institute at Fordham, she has an IP practice. So people see both of us, and they're like, oh, I guess that's what fashion law is, just IP repackaged. But it's really not. And we have been able to take this new area and grow it into something much bigger than just me or just Susan. So that brings me to what, sorry, if I'm, that was a little too long, but we're, we're having fun today, right? It's 9 a.m., we had our coffee. So what is fashion law, right? It is an industry-based practice, again, very different fields and very different areas. So if you're like, I'm not an IP person, but I love fashion, I'm like, real estate re leasing. I'm like, I think that's a big area of where we're going in the future. But there's, fashion law has become a thing. I wrote a blog post that was called Fashion Law 101, How to Create a Movement. And, and people say, well, what's a movement? I'm like, you get a whole bunch of people all of a sudden talking. It's like a trend, right? All of a sudden, people are talking about fashion law. You're like, ooh, there's a fashion law blog. Or there's this conference on fashion law. This year, there's like five symposiums on fashion law. We got very lucky. <laughs> like, it's a good year for me, right? But people start talking about it. And I don't know, they say, like the creative people say, it's out in the zeitgeist, right? I'm like that big law school word. Or there's sort of how trends happen. People start talking. They're like, oh, I like this idea. And then someone starts blogging about it. And then there's these, you get a couple influential people. Susan was on the East Coast. I was on the West Coast. There's a great blogger in Chicago. Charles, you started writing about it. We have some IP people in New York. And sooner or later, we reach a tipping point. And now we're a trend and now we're cool, right? So in 2012, Rudder said that fashion lawyers were a must-have accessory. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I'm an accessory now, <laughs> you know? Like my, my, my mom, she wanted to be the doctor, lawyer, and accountant, like every good Jewish person, you know, Jewish mom, right? And she's now I'm an accessory. I don't know if she would like that so much, but you know, she lent me her fax machine, so it all worked out. <laughs> so. You have fashion law coming to the forefront of the, of, of, the, of the national conscience, right? So either it was through bloggers that helped. We also had some really big cases pending. Everyone knows about the YSL case with Louboutin, and that was in all the press. The design piracy bill came, and that really you know, started people thinking. Cal and Chris's article on the piracy paradox, in my mind, is what started it all. Um, and that kind of put a lot of the design and the need for design protection at the forefront of the fashion law movement. And all of these things helped kind of spark the interest to where now we teach it at Loyola. And I'm like, this is awesome, right? And I was at a meeting, you know, you guys will see as you graduate, but like the deans like to meet with former students and they like to kind of check in and see how you're doing and all that kind of stuff. So I was at one of those dinners with the Dean of Loyola Law School and he was talking about the future of Loyola. And he's like, we want to build our entertainment department and eventually we want to have a fashion law class. And I said, well, I want to teach it for you. Kind of my, in my outspoken way, you know? <laughs> and he's like, you're hired. I'm like, awesome. So that's how we started our fashion law program at Loyola. And it did so well that in the next semester, we had so much interest. In the next semester, Deborah was here, and she'll talk later. She taught our second class, fashion law business agreements, fashion law agreements, business transactions. I kill it every single time. I'm sorry. We added another class on modeling law. We're adding, we added a fashion law clinic. We're adding a fashion M&A class. And all of the interest was so overwhelming. It was the students, right? They asked the deans. And so that's you guys. Like, if you want something taught in your school, you go ask the deans because you're paying for it. This is your education, this is your life. And so our students went to the deans and they said, we want this class. So okay, we'll give it to you. <laughs> and it's, the interest was so great that they launched what we now call the Fashion Lab Program. 
project, sorry. And our goal with that project is back to, you know, it's very much in line with what I hoped to accomplish when I went to law school. We take these interlocking circles of people and we're going to program and offer them knowledge to help them build a better business or know more about their business before they start. So we're, we have a program for our law students. We have, I get so many emails from people that are like, I'm a practicing lawyer and I want to learn more about fashion law. What can I do? And there's not a good place for me to send them. So we want the lawyers that want to maybe make a career change or didn't take fashion law or fashion law didn't exist when they were in law school. We want the law students who are in our school already. There are 11 design schools in Los Angeles. So we want to help designers because so many of them <laughs> are not familiar with the laws at all and they just kind of go their own way and they learn about the laws usually when they're getting sued. Which is unfortunate because we can help them if we just kind of get them in the beginning and kind of put things, you know, in order. Again, if you know what you're doing that first 12 months and you're set up for success, your chances are exponentially higher that you're going to succeed. And then we want to target the fashion industry executives in Los Angeles. Those 10,000 apparel manufacturing companies are run by people. There might be a licensing department or an HR department or a production department. And there's just people who have business, either, you know, probably don't even have business degrees, right? They graduate from a college, they end up at one of these companies, they're doing a job, and they learn licensing just on the job. So wouldn't it be cool if they had a place to go? There's no MCLE. You're not like a lawyer or an accountant, right? So wouldn't it be cool if they had a place to go to learn a little bit more about their jobs? Now, production and supply chain, everyone's talking about code of conscience and sustainability and made in the USA and social responsibility and every, all the big companies are coming out with those kind of programs. Well, the lawyers may write them, but we're not running them. So those executives should come to Loyola and we'll have programming for them. So we're trying to create this umbrella program and giving people the tools to make their lives and their jobs easier and to hopefully make their companies a little more successful. So this is, in my opinion, how we kind of became a movement. And this is what fashion law is. We're this broader umbrella that overlaps a lot of different industries and a lot of different people at one point, you know, all at one time. So, do you want to be a fashion lawyer now? Have I made it kind of exciting? Sound like fun? <laughs> you got to wear pretty clothes? I get paid in clothes sometimes, which is actually really pretty cool. They're like, I'm like, you know, I'm, and, you know, it's nice because if I get paid in money, I'm a partner in a firm, I have to give it to my law firm. But if you send me like jewelry or like a cool pair of shoes or a nice pair of jeans, sh oh wait, you guys are recording this. I didn't say any of that. I give it all, I give it all to, <laughs> I give it all to the firm. Shh. But I hope you can see a little bit from my story that fashion law is an opportunity. And I think it's an opportunity for all of you guys. If, it's, if you're an IP, if you're here because you're, you know, you're interested in intellectual property, there is a lot going on with fashion law and IP. And we're going to talk about how that is a little bit more as the day goes on today. So you, there's IP components. People say, what do I think are the biggest emerging areas in fashion law? I personally think it's real estate leasing and fashion M&A, two huge areas where there is a lot of activity right now. Because of the economy, all of these big fashion brands have a lot of money on their balance sheet, and they don't know what to do about it. So they are going and they're acquiring smaller companies, or the venture funds are putting money in and buying out, or the investment bankers are buying out these big companies. And who has to do all that deal work? The M&A guys. But they don't know anything about fashion. Like they got to do their due diligence and do clear the trademarks and to look at the processes and look at the, the code of conduct and all this stuff. Is there a loss? But they, so they don't understand the nuances of the fashion industry, but they know how to run a deal. And we've found that if you have a fashion lawyer running that deal, the deal's going to go much smoother and everyone's going to get their all the stuff done much faster with a lot less angst and it'll run much smoother. Manufacturers are now turning into retailers. It's another trend in the fashion industry. Everyone's talking about vertical manufacturing. What does that mean? So the manufacturer is the person who sells you the goods actually makes it and sources it themselves. Might be through a chain of subsidiaries, but generally it's all done by the same entity. And you're seeing specialty companies open their own stores because they're tired of dealing with the majors like Federated or Macy's or Nordstrom's or Dillard's. They're tired of them making them pay marketing money 
or chargebacks I mentioned when I first started speaking. Like if you don't, if your goods don't sell, the manufacturers make you take returns, they make them give you discount and allowance monies. I'm sorry, the retailers make the manufacturers give them all this money. And it really squeezes the margins on the manufacturers, so they're like, we're tired of this. We want to sell it ourselves and make that profit. So if something, if something costs you, say, $5 to make, you'll sell it to the retailer for 10, and the retailer will sell it to the, to the customer for 20. So if I can make the, from the five to the 20, that $15 margin, instead of the five to the 10, that $5 margin, I'm gonna do that. And why am I telling you all this? Because as the manufacturers turn into retailers, what do they have to do? They have to open the stores. And manufacturers in general are not very good at retail. There's a big learning curve there as well. So as they go into retail, retail, I was a guest, I worked there in between after the summer after my first year in law school, and I worked there all the way up until my summer associate uh, position at Thielen. And that was right after they, they were trying to recover from their launch into retail. And their move from being just a manufacturer and wholesaler into retail, into retail almost put the company out of business. And, but then they learned what they were doing. And I had a great year. I learned lease administration. <laughs> I'm like, what's an HVAC? I don't know. I'm like, is that a vacuum cleaner? Um, so I learned lease administration, and that was a very lucky skill because it's turned out to work really well. Because as more and more companies become like guests and want to have their own retail stores, you need to learn how to read a lease. You need to know how to negotiate, and especially because all the malls and that kind of space is run by like three or four companies. So that is an amazing skill that if you like the fine print and you like land, so the, some of the retailers, the, the real estate lawyers I know, they call themselves dirt lawyers, kind of a code name amongst themselves. It's a great place to go. And that need is not gonna change, especially because you're seeing a shift in consumer buying patterns as well. So you see, we're seeing right now a rise of made in America. We're seeing in America right now, people wanting, coming, want, wanting to shop at Main Street. They don't want to go to the malls anymore. I'm like, or they want to shop on their phones. And they want your they want your experience to be in the digital world to match what your experience is like in the physical world. And personally, I can't I can't stand going to department stores. There's nobody there. I can't find anything. It's all smushed together. The visuals are terrible. Like, I don't know how to like dress myself. And I'm actually pretty good at it. But if I can't find it, how can I put an outfit together? So with the rise of retail, you're also going to see a rise of digital and e-commerce and privacy and technology. And right now, that's like the wild west of, of fashion. Everyone's talking about omnichannel. And what does that mean? Being able to look at products on multiple devices and have them all work together at the same time. Seamless experience from your online world to your offline world. And you know, when you go to a website, and you look up a cur uh, some shoes or a bag or a shirt, and you walk into the store, and you're like, can I buy these shoes? The sales associate looks at you like you're crazy. They don't know that there's a special on the website. Half the product's not the same. And then they're like, we can get that for you. You know, so what if you could just walk into the store and show them the product and someone would bring it to you? Or what if your phone knew that you were walking into the store and where you were looking and what you were looking at? Oh, wait, that happens already. Most of the major retailers are tracking your patterns when you walk into their stores. Now, they collect data about you as well. You're on their Facebook page, you're on their mailing list, you pay by your credit card, and they have the ability to take all this data and funnel it down and correlate and have these algorithms that they can predict your shopping behavior. They send you targeted emails based on your pattern. Their GPS in our phones allows them to track us. Is that okay? I don't know, but they're doing it. They don't know, but they're doing it. So sooner or later, like you guys are probably going to be the ones that write those laws or write those terms and conditions or write those warnings or maybe you're going to sue them to stop. <laughs> I don't know. But that is like the great area of where fashion law is going because no one's, I mean, someone needs to write it and you need to understand how the retailers work and why they need all this data to kind of fix it, right? Right, so I'm like, did you know that, that they're tracking you on their, your GPS on your phones? When I learned that and I saw my first map, I'm like, oh, 
this is amazing. And right now it's blind, like they don't know who you are, at least most of the ones that I know about. So they'll just see a little map and they'll see how long, it's like the page views online. Like they know where you've gone, where your eyeballs are, what you looked at, for how long you were there. I'm like, that's incredible. I didn't know we had that technology. I'm like, and I didn't know they were watching. Like you, you figure there's like your sense of privacy or your expectation of privacy when you go into a department store is very low. You know, you know that they have cameras, but you don't know that they're watching your eyeball movements. Like, to me, that's just amazing. And that's the way the world is going. And that's what I get to do every day. Like, it's so cool. <laughs> I'm like, so what do we do? I'm like, we have this new really cool program. We want to implement this in our 300 stores. How do I make sure it's legal? Like, I don't know if anyone knows that question, but let's figure out the answer. So I get to draft all those crazy terms and conditions that I used to read as a kid and, or sorry, as, when I was right out of college, and it was really exciting for me. And so there's all this opportunity for any of you to kind of go into this area. And it's really important, if you want to start this journey, I would recommend to you that you make a plan, right? It doesn't have to be sophisticated. You can take out a piece of yellow paper on your computer or even on your phone. Like, where are the five steps that I can take to become a fashion lawyer, right? What do you need to do? And you need to graduate, right, first, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and then you need to become a really great lawyer. And then once you understand the practice of the law, you know, two, two or three years is fine. You don't have to be a lawyer for a really long time. Then you can start focusing on industry. And while you're learning how to be a lawyer, learn about the fashion industry, right? You get a part-time job at The Gap, great training or wherever, pick your favorite store. Learn retail, work at Starbucks, that's fine too. Learn how to interact with customers. Understand the business of fashion. Read Women's Wear Daily every day. You know, start reading some of these blogs that have really kind of changed the world a little bit because they give you access to information and insight to information that you couldn't get when I was your age, you know? So you can too join the movement and it would be really nice to see all of you join us. I think that there is a lot of good that we can do. That creative, the business, and the legal coming together to create something new that didn't exist before, that's very exciting for me. You know, I go and Loyola's like, go get us some money because we're launching this fashion lab project. I'm like, okay, I didn't know fundraising was part of my job, but I'm like, all right, I'm like, what do I need? So they tell me what I need to do, what do I need to say, okay. So just go out for ask people for money. And when I, I do that, I'm like, look at what we can accomplish together, right? You have a part, you have the ability to be in on the ground floor of this thing called fashion law that's never been done before. And we can create it any way that we want. And that's really exciting because I'm so tired of having to be told like, you're too young, or you're a girl, or you, you're not smart enough, or you like nice shoes and don't use Latin. Who cares? And like, as you can use Latin if you want, and you can dress in a nice outfit, or you can wear a suit. As long as you provide good services that are on point to your clients, I don't think the rest of that matters. That's my personal opinion. I know there's a lot of people who disagree with me that you have to wear a suit and look in a certain way, but I don't think that that's true. And but here it is: we're creating this, and it's soon enough in this fashion law movement that you can help be a part of it, and you can make it into. Whatever area, let's add, maybe there's some facet of the fashion industry I haven't mentioned, and that's your area of interest. Well, you know, I would think it'd be fabulous if you kind of follow your heart and your passion and put that together and maybe help change the world a little bit. Everyone, <laughs> so I was asked by a recorder, did you set out to change the world? And I said, I don't, I don't really know if I have. And they're like, well, you created something where it didn't exist before. I'm like, well, I didn't create it. There was a bunch of us. It was a movement, whatever. He's like, no, you really kind of created something new. You're one of the founders of this fashion law movement. I'm like, okay. I'm like, that's pretty cool. And I'm like, and if I can do it, like, and you know, I just, this was my path and this was my journey, but you can do it too. And you're here today, so you're clearly interested, or maybe someone dragged you, I don't know, or maybe you're just interested in IP, or you just kind of like clothes. That's okay. But if you kind of put your heart into it, and you say, what can I do with my life, and this is what I want to do, you can do it. If you set anything you set your mind to, you can accomplish. So, and we need all the help we can get. We're still a growing field. It's a new area of law. My goal is to see it taught in every single law school across the country, similar to entertainment law. So we need you. So.
I appreciate you letting me talk to you and start out the day today. Thank you for your time and energy. And I invite you all to become part of the fashion movement. I hope I see you sometime in the future.